Amen. Is God good? That's what we're talking about today. That God is a good God. And um, we've been in this series and we're going through the book of Mark. And just so you know, we're going to be in the book of Mark until August, okay? So there's a lot in the book of Mark. And, uh, and last week, I think we wrapped up with chapter 5. And uh, you would think we'd go to chapter 6 today, but we're not. We're going to chapter 14. So we're, we're skipping ahead, all right? We're cheating a little. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to open on your phone or in an app or you've got a physical Bible, that's awesome. Um, we're going to be reading through chapter 14, the first, I think, 20-something verses here this morning, first 20, um, or 31 verses, and, uh, and, and we'll get there in just a minute. Um, now, we're doing this because we're moving into a season heading towards the end of the month, March 31st, is Easter Sunday, right? And so that's what we're doing now. We're starting the road to Easter and, and the process of Jesus with his elders walking on that path to getting to the cross and then eventually to the resurrection. Hallelujah, right? Like we're getting, we're getting there, but we want to lead our way um, up to that moment on Easter where we get to celebrate together. Now just a reminder, I was going to say it later, but Easter Sunday here, we are doing two worship gatherings on Easter Sunday, 9 and 11. So if you want to figure out which one you're going to come to, you can start doing that. So Easter Sunday. Sunday, 9 or 11, kids programs will be available for both gatherings, and um, that'll be a great time. So we're heading that way. Now, if you haven't been here at New Hope, this is the way we teach. We go through books of the Bible. We want you to understand God's Word, and we want to make God's Word make sense to you and in your life, and um, going through Mark has been awesome, because we're learning a lot about Jesus. We're learning a lot about healings, miracles, um, knucklehead disciples, right? We're learning all sorts of stuff as we go through um, in, in this gospel, which is really awesome. And, and we're heading to... For, uh, for, 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 it's been a while since I preached, all right? So <sighs> as we head <laughs> now to chapter 14, let me explain where we're at, okay, in, in this scene as we're going to kind of go through three separate parts of, of the message. And in this scene, we, we see the disciples have been following Jesus for three years, right? And, and, uh, and, and he's been doing miracles. He's been casting out demons. He's been healing people. Um, they've seen people resurrected from the dead, Lazarus. Or like, they've seen a lot of things in that time ministering with Jesus. And Jesus gave them power and sent them out to do the same things. They were casting out demons. They were healing people. And so you would think by now, after three years of doing this, these disciples would know exactly what's going on. They would completely understand what Jesus is saying all the time, but that's not what's going on when we get to chapter 14. There's still things that have just gone over their heads that, that, that they don't understand yet. Things that Jesus has been trying to reveal to them. He's spoken clearly about some things, preparing them for the fact that he is going to die, but it's like they ignore it. Have you ever had somebody like say something to you and like they're telling you something that's going to happen, but you just don't want to believe it, right? Have, have you ever had a moment like that where it's like, no, 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 no. Like that's, I don't know if that was what's going on with the disciples, but that's where they are when we get into chapter 14. Um, so, so with this, we're jumping into this scene now because they're heading towards Jerusalem. Now, this season for Jews, heading to Jerusalem is, is a big deal. They're coming to celebrate um, Passover. And it was actually mandated. Anybody that lived within like 15 miles of Jerusalem, was they had to come into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover that week. It was a part of the law and part of the expectations. And then all the other Jews who lived farther than that, they, they would love to, and a lot of them still came to Jerusalem. And so we're talking about this city, now a couple of million people showing up who weren't there before. So you just imagine what's going on in, in Jerusalem right now. Just the hustle and bustle, the, the packed houses, every room is filled. Um, I mean, it's like, it's crazy. And this is the scene that Jesus, the disciples, that they're going into as Jesus is heading towards something, right? And as he's trying to prepare his disciples for it. So let's, let's hop into Mark chapter 14, and we're going to just read the first nine verses as we start the sermon this morning. So if you have your Bible with you, it's open, you're ready, say, yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, here we go. I'll be reading up here. You can read along in your own scriptures. It says, now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. Now, we haven't seen all the story yet, right? We haven't seen everything that's happened with the religious leaders, but we've seen enough to where they are ticked off at Jesus. 
he, he is calling them names, right? He's, he's telling them what you do isn't what the kingdom of heaven is actually all about, right? He, he's, and, and so they're getting more and more ticked off because he's pushing against their religion and he's teaching the kingdom of heaven as a relationship, right? And he's trying to flip the whole system. And so they are angry, and this is a part of Satan's scheme that got planted in the garden in Genesis that we talked about. We went through the book of Genesis where Satan wants to bite his heel. Satan wants to kill the seed, the Messiah, the Savior. And so it's interesting how the church in that time was the place where Satan was working the most to get rid of Jesus. What? Right? Like, do you think Satan ever wants to mess with churches? Yeah, he does, right? It still happens today, unfortunately. Um, if you, if you don't have your armor on, get ready for attack, right? And there's a lot of churches that don't have their spiritual armor on. It's unfortunate. So here's Satan working with the priests and the teachers, and they're trying to arrest and kill Jesus. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. So all that energy, two million people, and uh, many of them have heard about Jesus. Some of them are talking and seeing the people that were healed, and like there's a buzz going on in Jerusalem about this Jesus. And they're like, we don't want a riot happening, so let's figure out how to do this, and let's figure out how to do it quietly. Verse 3, while he was in Bethany, Jesus, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came in with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. Now, I don't know if you go to Macy's and buy your pure nard there, but like, like uh, you know, for us, nard doesn't sound like a pretty thing, right? But like for them, that was an expensive thing. It was a perfume that was like really potent, really powerful, and was very expensive. But I don't want us to skip on where we're at here. This is a scene that's in all the Gospels, okay? So we know that in Bethany, they were at the house of Simon the leper and a woman. Now we know this woman is Mary. It's, it's Mary, the, the sister of Lazarus. So I'm assuming Mary and Martha and Lazarus are probably hanging out. At this, they're at this dinner too. Could you imagine the conversations around the dinner table? Because it says Simon the leper. Now, if he was still a leper, they wouldn't be going to his house, Right? Because lepers are like, they were unclean. Like, you couldn't go around them. You didn't want to get leprosy. But they're at his house, which means he has been what? Healed. Okay, come on over, Jesus, right? (laughs) Like, I'll feed you whatever you want. Come on over. I'm excited to have you. Imagine the conversations between Simon and the leper who had been healed from this disease of his skin that caused him to be unclean around everybody, and Lazarus, who was dead and resurrected. Would you have anything else to talk about, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like Buzz Aldrin. I've been to the moon. What else are you going to talk about, right? Like, I've been to the moon, right? Like, like this is that scene. It's like, what else are we going to talk about? Like, like, just imagine being at that dinner, hearing these conversations. So they're talking, Jesus is talking, and then Mary comes in with his alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. Now, I want you to understand what it says very expensive, Okay. Because later on, we, we're going to read this, that um, they said it was worth a year's wages, okay? Now, if, if you were to go to Macy's and go get some perfume, you know you go in that section of the mall, and it's like, you smell all of them, and all of a sudden you have a headache, right? It's like all the smells all together. But the mo- probably, you know, the most expensive perfumes you'd get there might be 150 bucks, $200, you know, for a decent jar. Um, jar, we don't do jars, right? The glass, you know... <laughs> bottle of uh, perfume like and that would be a pretty big investment for most of us in this room right be like that's a lot to spend on cologne um now imagine going to macy's and saying hey i want the best that you got all i have to pay is fifty five thousand dollars what do you got now does that sound ridiculous right right that's what this perfume is worth a year's wages. The average American wage is like fifty five, fifty seven thousand a year. So imagine going in and buying perfume and saying, I'm looking for the best. I only have fifty five thousand dollars. And putting that down. And I'm hoping it's a jug, right? If I'm if I'm I'm, I'm not expecting this little thing, they're like, oh no, this is the rarest nard you've ever had, you know, like <laughs> but this is this is what it was. It was this alabaster jar, which would have had value in and of itself. That was pretty extravagant, an alabaster material that was hewn out and made into this shape that put this expensive perfume in. And so she's coming to Jesus, carrying this. It's made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. 
Whoa. Whoa. The jar was valuable. It's broken now. The perfume, you're not going to use it after it's poured out. It's now been used fully. So some of those present, which were some of the disciples, other people, saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? (laughs) I mean, they're all blown away. They're like, what did she just do? Like, that must have been an accident, right? Like, she must have tripped and fell and, and oh, no, you, ah, you know, that, no, 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 she intentionally broke it. She intentionally, what a waste. It could have been sold for more than a year's wages, more than a year's wages. And the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. See the word harshly. Jesus is, imagine Jesus, he's sitting there, Mary, who he has, he, he's already spoken to Mary. Mary's already been at his feet learning. He's already spoken to Mary and Martha and Lazarus and the rest and be like, she's chosen the better thing when she comes and sits at my feet and listens rather than being busy and going and going and going. That's a whole other sermon, right? And now here she does something even more extravagant. And the disciples, the disciples, these knuckleheads are like ticked off, harshly rebuking her. Like, why did you just do that? Why did you just waste that? Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. He tries to give them perspective. Not all of them get it, right? (laughs) But he tries to give them perspective. For Jesus, this extravagant, costly anointing for Mary was a beautiful thing. And then he makes a point, and I need you to hear this very clearly, because he's not saying, ignore the poor, when he's saying, the poor you'll always have with you. He's like, so just ignore them, he, he actually puts a statement. The poor you always have, and you can help them anytime you want. So he's saying, still help them. <laughs> help those who are in need around you. Like, that's, I'm not negating that. But this thing that she did is because you're not going to have me forever right here. Now, I'm sure they're, they're confused. It says, she did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare my burial. Now the disciples, Lazarus, Martha, Simon, like all of them were probably like, what? He's like, imagine Jesus. I mean, how fresh. He's like, I've already told you guys this. You know, he's like, I've already said it many times beforehand. I'm, the son of man is going to have to be in the grave. I'm going to raise again. Like, but they're still like, are any of you kind of like the disciples? Right? Sometimes it's just like Jesus and God, God's just like trying to tell us something. And he, he has to repeat it over and over and over again. But I, I, I'm hoping by the end of this, you're going to learn about the character of God. Because in this moment, he's, he's trying to help them understand that this is a greater thing. Then he says, truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So now he flips the script. Do you remember the conversation? Well, I don't know if we've gotten, we haven't gotten there yet, right? The sons of Zebedee, right? The sons of thunder, that they were like, I want to sit at your right hand. I want to sit at your left hand in heaven, right? Like they're, like, they're like trying to earn their way into being like, Jesus is right and left. And like their mama was a, a part of that conversation. It's like, any mamas in the house? Like my boy's going to be, you know, like that kind of thing. Like, so like this, so they're like, you know, they're like trying to get their way into like being with, with Jesus. And, and Jesus is like, you guys are missing the point. It's not about like being good enough or being like the best or being like, like chosen to sit on my right like he says no but her who humbled herself who who did this amazing act in worship her name she's going to be mentioned every time the gospel's talked about not the disciples 
I want us to get a few things from the first part of this message, okay? And, and you can fill in the blanks if you've got your worship programs. I put them all on one screen so you can start writing. But, but here's three things I want us to learn about Mary's extravagant act of worship. Number one is that she was beyond generous to her Savior, right? For her, she was, she was not withholding anything. She went and got the most valuable thing she probably owned and gave it to Jesus, <laughs> anointed Jesus. She was beyond generous to Jesus in worship. Number two, she was focused solely on Jesus and not the others. Her worship, when she was, I mean, I, I don't, who knows what she was thinking when she went and got that jar, Right? What would have been going through her mind? Oh, they're going to judge me for this. Oh, I don't know if I should do this or not. Or this is expensive. Or like, you know, I don't, what thoughts would go through your mind if that were Jesus in your home and you felt like you wanted to do this extravagant thing? Like, would you be questioning? Like, maybe I'm out of my mind. Maybe I ate bad pizza last night and it's making me think we're today. Like, or maybe like, like, like all these different thoughts going through your mind. But for her, she wasn't thinking about what anybody else was thinking. Because the others were against it. <laughs> the others were harshly speaking down to her, but I don't think she was looking at them. She was solely focused on Jesus. And the last one is that she was blessed by Jesus for her act of worship. None of the other ones were. None of the, none of the disciples were. Jesus blessed her. She will be spoken of whenever this is shared. And it's in all the Gospels. <laughs> All the disciples and all the writers of the Gospels were like, oh, this one, Jesus said this one has to be in here. <laughs> so like, she is going to be mentioned. And so she was. Now, I wonder for all of us, do you worship Jesus like this? I, you know, I, I, I'm not judging anybody. I'm not judging your heart. I'm not judging, you know, your desire to be in God's presence. I'm not judging any of that stuff, just so you know. Okay, whenever I bring a challenge, it's because I'm challenged by it too. You all with me? And like this moment with Mary is a challenge for us in our culture today on how we worship God. Who is your focus when you're worshiping? And whether that's worshiping in your car when you're driving, whether that's worshiping in your prayer time at home, whether that's worshiping here on a Sunday morning with a bunch of other people, like who is your focus? Who are you thinking about? Do you worship without worrying about others? Or when you're in God's presence, are you like kind of just wondering who's around you and kind of thinking, oh, if I, if I sing too loud, they're going to look at me and be like, can you stop, please? Because you're like, I can't sing. That's why the music's decently loud here. <laughs> That's why when you're in your car, turn it to 11, baby. Like, person in the other car, if they hear you, that's on them. Their windows are down. I don't care. But like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Are you worried about other people thinking harshly about you for your worship? Are you worried about other people when all of a sudden you're like, oh, my hands are right about here. Are they looking at me? Are they looking at me? It's like, they shouldn't be. <laughs> and you're like, oh, but did I put enough deodorant on? <laughs> Am I being real? Am I being real? Like, we worry about all sorts of things when we come into God's presence. We worry about all sorts of things when we come to worship all together. And it's like, why are we worrying about this when we have the God of the universe who is present with us? Amen. I want to be more like Mary. God, I don't, I, this is all I've got, but I want to be overly generous with what I have. Amen. Whether that's financially, seriously, we say giving is a part of our worship. It is a part of our worship. And so I say, God, when I give to your work in the church, here, it's yours. And do you know what he does? He multiplies it. I don't know how. It's just how God works. Are we generous with our words? Are we generous with our acts? Are we generous with our hands and our bodies and clapping and celebrating? Are you generous to God when you worship him? Because I need you to know he's worthy of it. Amen. Mary knew it. Mary knew it. And whether you worship or not in the end, 
It says this in Revelation 5, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them. So that's pretty all-inclusive. In the end of all of this, they will be praising God to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. In the end, everything's going to worship. Let's practice while we're here. Does that sound good? Let's get our hearts not worrying about other people, not worrying about like what we're doing. Like, let's just be in the presence of God. Let's practice what's going to happen when we get to be with him forever and praising him and worshiping him because he is worthy of it. That's the last film blank here. Jesus is worthy of my worship. That's supposed to be of, okay? Jesus is worthy of my worship. He's worthy of it. This is what we're going to do. Um, we're going we're gonna to stand together. We're going to... Um, we're going to do some different things throughout the morning. One, we're going to do some congregational reading, which we don't do that often here. And we're going to read from a few psalms. And these psalms, I think we're going from 114 to like 118. These psalms that we're going to be reading, or Psalm 115 to 118, are the psalms that Jesus and his disciples would have sang in worship after they took communion. I think that's so cool. We're saying the same words that Jesus and his disciples worship God to as we read these passages together. And then we're going to sing the song called Do The Doxology, which is very similar to what we just read of what we're going to be singing in heaven forever. So let's stand together and, and let's, read this, um, let's read this scripture together. Here we go. Not to us, Lord... Not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Next. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. God, lead us in this time of worship as we sing the doxology and as we join all creation that worships you. So just lead us in this moment. <clears throat> so we continue on in this scene with Jesus, the disciples, right after this, right after this extravagant moment. And we see, uh, <laughs> we see one of the disciples who, uh, who has issues with all of this going on, right? His name is Judas, Judas Iscariot, right? And Judas, we know, Judas is the betrayer. And uh, if you don't know the story, he's it, all right? So i um, not trying to spoil anything. And so Jesus, uh, the Judas, um, we learn about his character. He's watched all the same things all the other disciples have seen. He's seen the miraculous. He's, he's seen all the healings. He's seen, like, he's been a part of this whole journey. But there's something off in his heart. And, uh, and we learn that he, as the money keeper, has been taking a little bit for himself, right? He's been stealing from the pot, and, um, and so that kind of exposes his heart. And something else I th think we see in Judas is that he was frustrated with what Jesus was doing because he had a different picture of what the Messiah was supposed to do, which many of people did. Many people who saw the miracles were waiting for Jesus to actually raise up as a actual king for the Jews and to then raise up an army to be able to rule over and take back everything that's been taken from the Jews so then they would rule over Rome and take over. And so many of the Jews were waiting for this moment, and even the disciples were kind of like, how is this all going to happen? You know, they probably have been th thinking about this, like, what is this going to look like? And Judas, most likely, was one of those, that's like, what is going on? Because this is not going the way I thought it should go. And now this moment... This moment, 
We're going to be kind of skipping around here a little bit. In Mark 10, or 14, starting verse 10, says, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So here's Judas betraying, right? On the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparation for you to eat the Passover? And so this is the scene we're seeing now, okay? So they've already had this extravagant moment of worship by Mary, and Jesus has already honored her in that process. Judas is ticked off. He's like, this is not what I want. And he goes to the priest. He's like, I'm your guy. I'm going to help you because this is not going the way I want it to. And he is going to sell Jesus out. The priests were like, oh boy, we got an insider, right? We got somebody who's, who's going to help us out so we can sneakily take care of this problem and get rid of this annoyance, this Jesus, so that we can keep doing what we've been doing for generations, right? That's their goal. And so they're getting ready and preparing for Passover, which is, was a, I mean, it was a powerful moment of celebration. I'll talk about it more when we get to the third part of the sermon, okay? But in this moment, I want us to understand that Jesus knows the hearts of every single person he's around. I could not imagine living like that. I don't want to know what's in your hearts, right? Like, I don't want to know, <laughs> you know? I don't want you to know what's in my hearts, right? Like, like, like hearts, I have more than one. <laughs> my heart. Um, but he does, and he knows their intent. He knows their actions. Like, Jesus sees everything with his disciples. And he knows everything about Judas and what's about to happen. And yet he's like, let's go. Let's go celebrate Passover together. So they get together in the upper room that they're celebrating. Now we're going to skip down a little bit, okay? I pushed the wrong button. So let's go down to verse 17. So when evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12. And while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. Imagine it was you sitting at that table. And he's, he's looking at you as he's looking around the circle. And as he's making eye contact with each of the disciples, he says, One of you are going to betray me. I would have been like, what? We know how Peter responds, right? <laughs> Peter's like, uh-uh, no way. Not going to be me, right? Like, we all would have our own reactions to that. Like, this, huh? This doesn't make any sense. We're all together, Jesus. We're all going through this together. It is one of the 12, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Uh-oh. Imagine now being Judas, sitting there, already having the conversation with the priests. Would you have stopped if you were Judas? Would you have been like, Oh, he's talking about somebody else. Judas knew he was talking about him. <laughs> he was, he, I'm sure he was like shaking in his boots in that moment or his sandals. <laughs> Jesus with that rebuke, better for if he had not been born. Let's keep reading. Let's skip down to 27. So he's, he's, he's preparing them. Somebody's going to do this. Now verse 27, now instead of just speaking to one person, he says, you will all fall away. <laughs> Jesus told them, he's like, wait a minute. You just said one of us is going to betray you. Now you're saying all of us? This is not a good meal, right? Like this is not, this, this is not good. Um, he says, no, 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 all of you will fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. So they, that just kind of went right over their heads, right? All they heard is like, we're all going like, to fall away from you. 
That's all they heard. They, 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 it's like they skipped the whole I will be risen and go to Galilee part. It's like, whoa, 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 you just, huh, huh? Because Peter, again, I love Peter. We all love Peter, Simon Peter, because like he just, he's all in, right? He's like, Jesus already changed my name. My name is The Rock. You know, like he's like, I'm in this, you know, I'm like, I'm a part of what's going on. And he's like, I'm going to be part of whatever. Jesus is like, no, no, no. He said, Peter declared, even if all fall away, I won't do it. He's like pointing at everybody else, but not me. Oh, Peter. <laughs> Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. That's a very specific thing to say, right? Why are we talking about roosters, Jesus? Like, what's, huh? Now you're getting very specific. But still Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. So it wasn't just Peter that was like, no. Like all of them were like, no, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Have you ever been betrayed? I think, I think most of us in the room can say, yeah. And the moment I said it, probably a name or a face came in into play. For some of us, we probably saw it coming, but for a lot of us, we probably didn't see it coming. Jesus saw it coming. He wasn't surprised by any of it. He's actually preparing them for what they're about to do, you know? He's, he's letting them know, just so you know, one of you is going to be the bad guy. The rest of you are still going to all fall away. Let's eat. You know, like, <laughs> what? What? Huh? What is going on here? I am sure I would have been emphatically, like the rest of them, saying, no. No way am I going to, no way I'm going to ignore you. No way I'm going to, like, fall away from you. Jesus knows our hearts. He knew their hearts. Here's my question for this one. Have you ever ignored God? Have you ever walked away from him, denied him, rejected him, disowned him, rebelled against him, disobeyed what you know he told you to do? Have you ever done any of those things? I have. Many times. When I see this scene of Jesus with his disciples, man, I, I don't know, like, when you first accepted Christ, or you first, like, maybe you've had those certain moments where you just know that you know that he's real. And, you, and like, when you understood how forgiven you are because of what he's done for you, and just, th there's something that turns inside of you that's like, I'm all in, right? I will do whatever for Jesus. I, I mean, I, you tell me, I'm all in. And just, you know, as pastors, we, we see this all the time. We see people who haven't been to church a long time. Maybe they accepted Christ as a kid, and then they're like, oh, and they felt it, and they come back to church. Maybe they show up to New Hope, and they worship. like, I'm all in. This is awesome. This is what I wanted. And they sign up and check every box on the Connect card. Like, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm going to a small group. And they get all passionate. And then, like, two weeks later, we never hear from them again. And it's like, what was all that? I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments. I want you to not, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty about those moments. But I, what I want you to do is to know that you're seen by God. And that God knows he knows your heart. He knows what's been going on. He, he knows maybe why you've drifted, why you've ignored him, why, like, he knows all of those things. And, and there's different responses we might have when we're in those seasons. It might be confusion. We might be afraid. We might be walking with shame, guilt. But here's the amazing thing in the scene with Jesus and his disciples. He still loved them. Like, he knew what was coming. He knew what Judas was going to do. And yet he still loved them. That's what I want you to hear about the character of God. Jesus, Jesus' love for you does not change. Whether you're, like, 
you're pumped, you're excited, you're all in, you're being intentional, you're, you're doing, you know, you're reading your Bible, you're praying to him every day, you're like, I'm getting plugged into church, I'm using my gifts, and like, you're doing all those things, and maybe you drift away from doing those things. Maybe you drift away from really staying connected with God or with his, his body called the church, or no matter where you are, here's the good news. Jesus' love for you doesn't change. Whether you're doing great or you're doing bad, his love is un conditional. That is hard for us to understand, isn't it? So hard for us to understand. Because for the, oh, maybe, mm, okay, where, how do I, what do I, okay, I'm doing it. So some of you are, um, how do I want to say this? <laughs> some of us have a tendency to judge people who are lesser than us spiritually. Like when we see somebody who was passionate for a moment and then they disappear, it's kind of like, I don't know what happened to them, whatever. And we just kind of judge. And we kind of just write off. Like our relationship changes with them because of what happened. And, and sometimes if you're the one that kind of walked away or you're the one that kind of was struggling, you feel that tension and you feel guilty. Like I can't really go back because it was my fault or because I, I, they're going to judge me. And unfortunately, in churches, some people might. They might. But that takes us back to worrying about Jesus more than other people, right? Because what, however people treat you, doesn't matter. Jesus' love never changes for you. He still died on the cross for you. So whether you're the prodigal son that ran away and just wasted part of your life, whenever that son came back, the father left the porch and sprinted. That's his love. I want the worship team to go ahead and make your way back up here. And, and I want us to just soak in that moment in Jesus' love for you. Whether, um, whether you're doing great with God or maybe you have been that, re- kind of had that rebellious spirit in you or you, you, you feel shamed about something. Today, I would encourage you to just ignore the shame and accept the love. Ignore the shame, accept the love. Ignore the fear, accept the love. Ignore the guilt, accept the love. Because when you bring your guilt, fear, and shame to the cross, he takes it from you. That's who he is. That's what his love does. So do you stand with me as we take this time just to worship him for this Jesus and worship him for that he doesn't change and his love doesn't change? God, we're grateful that your love doesn't change. We're grateful that, um, God, that (laughs) that no matter how far we run, you just, you run after us. You want to be with us. So as we sing this song, as we proclaim what you've done for us, encourage us. Help us, help us to feel and sense. Holy Spirit, just wrap us in the love of our Heavenly Father. Let's just worship Him. As we walk through this um, this morning, um, this is good. We, we, we're coming to the section of the message, kind of moving back up into this moment where Jesus... Um, you know, celebrating Passover with, with his friends, you know? Even though he's saying, you're all going to fall away from me, like, there's friends. These are, the, these are the guys he spent the most time with in this time. And, um, and he is about to change, <laughs> he's about to change something that, that they have done from infancy, you know, childhood, young adulthood, all the way through their adult life, the celebrating of Passover, and Passover was a reminder to the Jews of what God had done for them, freeing them from the land of Egypt. It's called the Exodus, right? They were living for hundreds of years as slaves in Egypt under Pharaoh. God sent Big Mo, Moses, and said, go, go let my people go. Like, you, you, that's your job. And this whole celebration, this whole celebration of Passover for the Jews was them celebrating what God had done to free them from that land of slavery, okay? 
And so in this meal, as they took Passover, there would be different you know, moments throughout the evening where they would, they would eat certain things, they would, you know, and then they would drink from different cups, and each cup they would drink from was usually, it was wine is what they would drink from. Sorry, we don't have wine today, but, um, but it was wine, and, and each cup would, would represent a different promise that God had given them through freeing them from that land of Egypt, Right? And so what we're going to see in a moment in this, in this uh, scene where Jesus institutes this thing that we now call communion, um, he is changing what they have heard their whole life and, and putting in something brand new. This is the beginning of Jesus preparing them for a new covenant. Their covenant relationship started in Exodus when God gave them Moses. Moses gave them, you know, God gave them the Ten Commandments, which was, this is how you relate with me and each other, right? And then he made this covenant with all of his people, like, this is how we're going to live. This is what it's going to look like. And now Jesus is saying, now this is new. Something new is coming. And that's what we're going to talk about as we head to Easter, right? This new thing that Jesus brought. And so this is what it says. Let's, let's hop into it and keep reading. Verse 22 through 26. So they're, they're at this meal. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. So he's breaking the bread, and he's handing it to each of them. Again, looking them straight in the eye. You know, in a minute after this, he says, and you're going to betray me, you're going to betray me. Okay, like, but he's doing this right now in this moment where he's, like, he's giving thanks, he's breaking the bread. He says, take it. This is my body. This would have been right over their heads. They would have been like, I, okay. This doesn't make any sense, but okay. they're taking it. This is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Then he said to them, truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So the hymns that they were singing were Psalm 115 through 118 as they're going out after they celebrated this Passover. Now, here's the thing. This is a really awesome moment. And, and I've talked, taught on this before. If you want to learn more about this, well, I've done series multiple times about the four cups. There's a series, I think, did we just do this last summer, the four promises that we walked through, which connect to our words here at New Hope, connect, grow, serve, and go. Because we actually believe those promises that we're talking about are still available for us, but they're in Christ Jesus. We get to live into these promises. But as they drank from these cups as a part of Passover, each cup represented a part of their freedom from um, Egypt. And these are the cups that they would drink for, the four cups of Passover. The first cup was the cup of sanctification. Then they'd drink from the cup of deliverance, the cup of redemption, and the cup of praise. The cup of sanctification was, they would say, you know, thank you for Moses and God. They brought us out of Egypt. They were sanctified. They were set apart from the slave land that they lived in to now be free. And so that is that first cup that they would drink for. Thank you, God, for taking us out of Egypt. And they said, and then they would go on later and they'd drink the second cup, the cup of deliverance, which sounds similar to the same thing, that God brought them out of Egypt. But this cup of deliverance is more that, and you delivered us from slavery. Meaning you took us out of the land, but now you're taking the land out of us. We were slaves, but we may still think like slaves. Now make us stop thinking like slaves so we can be delivered. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so that's the second cup that they would drink from, thanking God for what he did to deliver them now to be with him. Then they drank from the third cup during this time, which is the cup of redemption. The word redeem is so good, isn't it? I, my definition to redeem is to bring back to original intent. And so this is them saying, God, thank you for bringing us back to you. We are now a people. We, we are your people, and we're all together, and that was your plan, to redeem us. And we still see that promise today for us, don't we? That God saves us from slavery to sin, right? He saves us from sin. That's, that's when we're saved. We're forgiven. And then we are delivered, meaning even though we're forgiven of our sin, we still have the potential to sin, and we still sin, Right? And so we still maybe think like a sinner. So now he's going to take the sinner out of us. He's going to grow us. He's going to free us 
from walking as a slave to sin. And then he wants to redeem us. He wants to put you back to his original intent. He has a dream and a purpose for you. And I'm telling you, it's good. It's really good. And so he wants to redeem, and that would be the third cup that they drink from. And then the last cup was the cup of Hallel. It's the root for our word hallelujah. It's the cup of praise, the cup of completion, saying it is finished. God did it all, and now we get to praise him. And you see what they did next. They read and sung the Psalms. Like, it's done. Look what God has done for us, the cup of praise and worship. Now, as they were going together, Jesus is now rewriting the script of this moment of Passover for them because they would have been used to this. We do this, we eat this, we drink this cup, we say this thing, we do this prayer, and it's just like a very ritualistic thing. And then he stops and says, okay, now this one, I'm breaking this bread, but this is different. This is my body. Uh Huh? Now, I, I want you to understand, when they're going through this, this is where Jesus stops. He takes the bread right here after the cup of deliverance. And he's starting to institute a new covenant. This new relationship that you're going to have through Jesus with God is about to happen. And he's preparing them, but they're, again, right over their heads. And still today, it goes over a lot of people's heads of what God has done through Jesus. So he takes that bread and he breaks it. This is my body. It's broken. It's going to be broken for you. And he's on his way to that journey to the cross. And then he takes this third cup, the cup of redemption, to bring back to God's original intent. And he takes this cup and he says, now this cup, the cup of redemption, this is my blood. Poured out and shed for you. This is Jesus saying, I'm the one that redeems. God saves, he frees. We're only redeemed because of the blood of Christ. That's what he does. And that's what he's trying to tell them. I am your redeemer. I'm bringing you back to the original intent and relationship with God. And it's through my body and my blood that that is gonna happen. And then he says, I'm not gonna drink from the fruit of the vine. He doesn't drink the last cup of Passover. They were probably like, when are we doing the last cup? They're used to it. They're like, we do the last cup, and he's just like, okay, let's go sing. I'm like, wait a minute, we skipped the last cup. And Jesus is like, oh, by the way, I'm not drinking the last cup. The last cup of completion, of hallelujah, of praise, I'm waiting for the wedding banquet. I'm waiting for the day. That's the day when he returns and brings all of us into his presence. It's the last feast and banquet when Jesus is reigning victorious and we are in his presence for all of eternity. Amen? Amen. And so he's saying, I can't wait to drink from that cup, but it's not now. I still have work to do. And then he institutes the church and the church has its work to do because we're called to help people be saved, be freed, be redeemed so they can one day celebrate and praise with God forever. That's why we help people connect, to grow, to serve, live into their purpose, and to go. We want to go be the church and love people, right? So when we take communion today, when Jesus instituted this, and we see through the rest of the New Testament, the early church, like, do this. (laughs) Paul says in Corinthians, do this. And when you do it in remembrance of what Christ has done for you, don't do it lightly, lightly. Like, don't like come up and think this is a meal. Because some of them in the church in their church were like, they were coming hungry and they would come to communion and be like, this is a meal time, man. And they would just be chowing on that bread and they'd be drinking all the wine. And he's like, that's not the point. This is not a meal. So I hope you ate breakfast. <laughs> and he said, some of them were coming and they were still sinning and sinning and sinning. I Meaning their hearts were not right with God. When you come, you're reminded of something. And this is your fill in the blank. Communion is remembering his, Jesus' death that gave us eternal life. And so when we take communion, that's what we are remembering. His body, his blood, broken and shed for you. So that you can have a right relationship with the holy and perfect God. This is the gospel. This is what God has done for you. And so we're going to respond in worship by taking communion together. And I would encourage you, this is a great time 
to check your heart, okay? Is a great time, like if, you're, if, if you've got just some unrepentant sin today and you're coming to church, A, I'm glad you're here. B, ask God to forgive you and it's forgiven. I would encourage you to do that before you take communion. Say, God, here's, here's this sin. Or if <laughs> one passage talks about if you are living in unforgiveness towards somebody, meaning you're just living in bitterness against them, you should make it right before you come to communion. What? We don't do that too often in church, do we? But that's how serious it is when we come to the communion elements. This is Christ's body and his blood. We don't take it lightly. Does that make sense? So if you're a Christ follower, I mean, if you've made a commitment to Christ and you have a relationship with him, you're invited to join us today, whether you're a partner of New Hope or whatever, like we want you to join us this morning. If you do not have a relationship with Christ, you haven't committed your life to him yet, you can just stay in your seat and that's okay. Nobody will judge you. Nobody looks at you weird, okay? This is gonna be a very personal time um, for, for us. But today, if you want a relationship with Jesus, if you want to be redeemed, if, it's really easy. You just turn. You turn from your sin. That's called repentance. You turn from your sin and you turn to God. And say, God, here is all my sin. Will you please forgive me? I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want to give you my life. I want to be forgiven of all my sins. And do you know what he does? He forgives you. He sets you free from it. You don't have to pay the cost of your own sin anymore because you can't anyways. And you're made right with God and you have a relationship with him right now. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So today, if you want to start that relationship and celebrate communion with us, I, I, let me lead you in that, okay? If that's you today. So let's all bow our heads for a moment. And if that's you, you I, I always say there's no magical prayer of the pastor. I don't get you to God. There's no more priests on this earth. Jesus is the only one. So when you pray, just pray it in your own words. Be honest with God. But you can pray something like this. You can repeat after me if you want to. You can say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not perfect. But I want to be with you. And so today I'm confessing my sin to you. If you want to, just get real with him and confess it. You say, I'm confessing my sin to you, God. And I'm asking, would you please forgive me of all my sins? I'm confessing that Jesus is your son, that he died on the cross to pay for my sin, and that he rose again and is alive today, and I want to be with him forever. And so I'm asking, would you save me, God? Enter into my life. Give me your Holy Spirit. Make me yours. I'm giving you my life. Help me to turn from my sin and help me continually turn towards you. And I just thank you for the cross. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And if that's you, if you make any decision on Sunday, please let us know. Mark that on your Connect card. We want to be praying for you. But if you have a relationship with Jesus, you can join us in communion. Let me give you some instructions here real quick. Um, so we're, we have uh, baskets with bread, and, and uh, we just use grape juice. The bread we use, it's, it's gluten-free bread, so everybody can participate this morning. Um, in it. Now this morning, we're going to do a little different. I'm going to have Brian and Sam and Jim uh, in the back, and then myself and Nikki are going to be up front, and we're going to be holding the elements. And so when you come to get communion, this is what we want you to do. We want you to rip off a part of the bread, okay? They're just little small loaves. Rip off a part of that bread, and then grab one of the cups, and we're going to bless you as you do it, okay? We're going to speak over you. This is Christ's body and his blood, broken and shed for you. And, and we want this to be a very personal time between you and Jesus, as if you were one of the disciples taking that moment with Jesus, thanking him for the new covenant, okay? So the ushers, they're gonna be, um, they're gonna be releasing you kind of row by row. The middle section here, you guys are gonna circle this way and back, it's behind the wall there um, and then back and around to your seats and and these sections over here are going to be circling in and, and uh, 
and the ushers will release you as you do that. And you can just take those elements back to your seat and take a moment. Just t- before you take communion, just take a moment. The band might start singing a song while you're doing that. Um, feel free to join in the song whenever you feel comfortable doing that because we're going to do two songs, okay? We're going to have plenty of time just to be in God's presence together as we do this. Sound good? So let me pray for us, and, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll enjoy communion together. God, thank you for this gift. Thank you for instituting communion. Thank you for, um, thank you for the cross. As we come before you, accepting your body and your blood that was broken and shed for our sins, for our forgiveness, help us see you personally right now, God. Each of us, help us see you. We just speak to each of our hearts. We, we want to hear you. And it's in Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so go ahead and wait for, for your road to be released as we, as we take this time together.